In Disney World, food isn't just fuel. It's part of the overall experience. But could your experience be ruined by the wrong eats and drinks? Let's talk about the things you should eat in Disney World and what you shouldn't here on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Not every Disney World food out there is going to be a magical experience with each bite. Some foods might be overpriced for what you get, some might be way too overhyped, and some might even kill that limited time you've got in the parks as is. So today, we're going to say no thank you to those red flag Disney foods and exchange them for eats and drinks we think you're going to find way more satisfying and worth your money. While you're busy planning out your Disney meals, as well as all the other important aspects of your upcoming Disney World vacation, go ahead and scan that QR code you see on the screen for our free Disney World planning worksheets. These are going to help keep everything nice and neat and organized for you. As Mickey says, make everything neat and pretty. So first up, now I haven't said this on the channel in a while. That's why I'm starting with it here. Grocery store snacks. Okay, I get that sometimes you don't want to venture too far out of your food comfort zone and you'd really rather eat something you're more familiar with instead of yet another adventurous theme park food. But regardless, y'all need to stop buying those name brand snacks inside the Disney parks. I'm talking about the candy bars you can buy at the end caps of your local grocery store, the small chip bags that normally come with your combo meal at sandwich shops, or those run-of-the-mill hot dogs that taste the same at Disney as they will at the gas station you'll hit up on your way back home. The only difference between buying these name brand items at Disney versus buying them outside of Disney is that you're gonna be charged a whole lot more for them inside the parks. If you're just wanting some basic snacks to munch on in the middle of the afternoon, and you don't need a specialty cupcake or cheeseburger spring roll to make you happy, make sure you purchase prepackaged snacks ahead of time and pack them in your park bag. Disney's totally cool with you bringing your own food into the park as long as it's not in a glass container, it doesn't need to be kept frozen, and you don't have to heat it up to eat it. Now, another big trend that Disney's going for right now signals too much food. Okay, this is one of the biggest complaints I hear from Disney World guests all the time, so stick with me. There are so many Disney World table service restaurants out there that force you to pay for more food than you actually want. There are a few ways that Disney does this. Strategy one, buffets. You're gonna pay a set price for full range of a buffet spread, which in order to get your money's worth, you'll have to go back to the buffet to mound up your plate several times over. Strategy two, family style, where the buffet will be brought to your table for your group to split among yourselves. And strategy three, those prefix menus, which give you a set meal price, much like the buffets and family style offerings. And that set price will usually cover one appetizer, one entree, and one dessert per person. And you have to pay for all of it, even if you're not gonna eat all of it. Now, this is not saying that the food you're gonna get at these restaurants is bad by any means. In fact, some of my favorite restaurants like Garden Grill in Epcot and Liberty Tree Tavern in Magic Kingdom, those are family style restaurants and they follow the same fixed price format. But if you're wanting a light lunch before getting back to those swelteringly hot theme parks to ride rides and walk miles on end, then having a heavy meal sitting in your stomach might not be as satisfying. In fact, it could be kind of miserable. And yet, more and more often lately, we're seeing Disney switch to these prefix dining formats just because it guarantees them a good chunk of your change with each meal, along with a variety of other reasons, like it's probably much easier to just make a set amount of food in the kitchen and you're only making the same items over and over again, you don't have a full menu, etc. But anyway, I digress. Take California Grill at Disney's Contemporary Resort, for instance. While this restaurant has never been cheap, you used to be able to get what you wanted off the menu as an a la carte menu. And so if you maybe didn't want an appetizer and a dessert, you just wanted the entree, that was fine. But during Disney World's 50th anniversary celebration, California Grill switched things up and kept it that way even after the 18 month long celebration wrapped up. You've gotta pay for an app, an entree, and a dessert for $89 per adult. Same thing goes with Be Our Guest Restaurant in Magic Kingdom. Once upon a time, that restaurant used to be a quick service option for lunch, which feels a very long time ago now, but because of its high demand just to see inside Beast's Castle, you gotta pay a prefix meal offered here too, which costs 67 per adult. Not to mention brand new restaurants with uber cool Disney theming like Roundup Rodeo Barbecue in Hollywood Studios and Space 220 in Epcot, also opened with set menus that serve up a whole lot of food. And Disney knows that even if you don't want that much food, you still gotta pay the price for it, just because you wanna check out all the immersive theming going on in the dining rooms. 
When it comes to these big meals that cost a lot to experience, I'm not saying to avoid them entirely, but just pick one or two that you believe are must-dos and make advanced dining reservations for them instead of filling each day of your trip with a hearty meal that's going to cost you a lot. Now, who knows? Maybe you're the kind of person like me who basically just wants to go to all the restaurants all the time. In that case, great. Go for it. But if you're trying to get in a full Disney Parks trip and some cool dining, just pick one or two that you think are really going to deliver. Also, don't forget that there are still plenty of sit-down restaurants that offer a la carte prices still. Some of our favorites include Skipper Canteen in Magic Kingdom, La Cellier in Epcot, 50's Primetime Cafe in Hollywood Studios, Yak and Yeti at Animal Kingdom, Chef Art Smith's Homecoming in Disney Springs, and Steakhouse 71 at Disney's Contemporary Resort. Disney's lounges also allow you to sit down for a nice meal and drink without having to worry about a prefix cost. And for most of them, you don't even have to worry about a reservation. Over at California Grill, you might still be able to find first come, first serve availability at their bar, which also has a limited selection of eats and a full selection of drinks. And get this, you'll still be able to see the fireworks from that 15th story balcony too, if you time your visit just right. The Space 220 Lounge will allow you to experience the Centauri Space Station while also providing you with a limited selection of apps that you can order instead of a full-on three-course meal. That one you might want to make a reservation for. Now on that note, keep in mind that while most lounges and bars do offer walk-up seating and wait lists, some like Space 220 and Oga's Cantina still require some advanced dining reservations most of the time. And B, select bar are only available for guests 21 years and older. These include Jelly Rolls at Disney's Boardwalk Inn, Trader Sam's Grog Grotto at Disney's Polynesian Village Resort after 8 p.m. And for the most part, kids will be allowed in bar and lounge areas, but they won't be allowed to sit at the bar itself. Okay, moving on to restaurants that steal your time. When you book a table service meal, you probably already have some sort of preconceived notion that it's gonna take a little time out of your day to experience. And if you're already kinda hot and sweaty and tired and hungry, then sitting in the AC for an hour and eating a nice meal might be 100% worth it. But depending on where you book a restaurant, it could suck up more time out of your day just based on travel time. That's right, nobody ever thinks about travel time, but it is very, very serious because of how huge Disney World is. For example, let's say you book a character breakfast at Topolino's Terrace in Disney's Riviera Resort. Great choice. If you're staying at the Riviera or at one of the other resorts on the Skyliner route, then getting over there should be a breeze. Same thing goes for if you're visiting Hollywood Studios or Epcot that day, since both parks have their own Skyliner stations too. But let's say you're staying at a different resort and then you're planning on going to a park that's not on the Skyliner route. First of all, you'll have to figure out how you're gonna get to Topolino's Terrace. If you have a car, you can drive on over since you'll have an advanced dining reservation and that'll allow you to park at the resort. But if you're relying on Disney's free shuttle services, then you'll have to go to one of the parks or Disney Springs shopping district first to transfer over to a Riviera bus since buses don't travel between hotels. In this case, it might just be easier to pay extra for a rideshare service to drop you off rather than wait 30 minutes plus just to travel from your Disney hotel over to Riviera. Secondly, after you're done dining, you're gonna have to wait for another bus to come pick you up from Riviera and take you to Magic Kingdom or Animal Kingdom. And if you drove or took a rideshare, then you'll have to factor in even more travel time to get to Magic Kingdom since you won't be able to park at the front gate. Rather, you'll have to park at the Transportation Ticket Center where you'll have to take either a monorail or ferry to take you the rest of the way to the park. Whew. Now, when it's all said and done, you've just gobbled up your whole morning simply by dining at the wrong location on the wrong day. Before you book a reservation for any restaurant, make sure it makes sense with your schedule. Planning on visiting Magic Kingdom? Then any of the resort restaurants on the monorail loop will be easy access. Heading to Animal Kingdom? Then it's not a bad idea to book an evening meal at Disney Springs, since this is the park that closes earlier than all the others. Whatever it is that you want to eat, just make sure it's not also going to eat up your time in the process. Next, of course, you don't want to eat anything you feel like you're just settling for, right? Disney World has a lot of restaurants, hundreds of them. So you don't have to pay for a meal you're not going to love. If your group all wants to go to Flame Tree Barbecue Quick Service in Animal Kingdom, but you really don't like barbecue, it's okay to mobile order a meal from somewhere else, like Satuli Canteen or Restaurant Asaurus or even Pizza Safari. And if you're absolutely starving, you don't have to just order from the closest quick service you see and settle for something basic. That's how people end up at Sunset Ranch Market, and nobody wants to end up at Sunset Ranch Market. The My Disney Experience app will actually let you know all the restaurants you can mobile order from and pick up immediately in the park that you're visiting. Just go to your mobile orders, create a new order, and tap on the filter that says available now to see all the different fast food restaurants that can prepare your food on the spot. 
If the parks are extremely busy and you're planning on just settling for whatever quick service restaurant seems the least packed, regardless of its menu options, then you can plan ahead and actually mobile order your lunch at the start of the day for the quick service or counter service location you actually want to eat at. That way, when lunchtime comes around, you'll already have your mobile order all set up so you can just go to the restaurant and have your meal prepared upon your arrival without having to wait in those long standby queues or having to wait on a mobile order return time that's an hour later than you would have wanted it to be. But how will you know which restaurants you wanna prioritize so you don't have to worry about settling for less on the spot? That, my friends, is why you come to us. Check out our 2023 DFB Guide to Walt Disney World Dining. It's over at the dfbstore.com. Gets updated twice a year fully updated, and it's packed with need-to-know dining details. It's got tools, it's got features to make your trip go super smoothly. Not to mention, it's portable. You can carry it right around in your pocket or backpack because it's on your digital device. Now, we're in Disney World every single day. We go to all these restaurants at least once a year, usually more than that. So we've got updated reviews and updated thoughts on each of these restaurants because they do change. Their menus change and the service changes. Lots changes at these restaurants. So we've got the most updated information for you right in that guide. And it's our goal to make sure that we can help you make good choices and never have to settle for food that you don't like in Disney World. Now, if you want to go ahead and pick up one of those guidebooks, make sure to use code YouTube over at dfbstore.com before you check out so you can get a discount. Now, of course, we're going to talk about Epcot festivals in this video, and you do not want to eat festival food that isn't worth the cost. Much like you don't want to settle on a Disney meal you're not hyped up about, you also don't want to waste your money and stomach space on Epcot festival foods that are going to be any less than impressive. For each of Epcot's four festivals, we're going to come across dozens upon dozens of festival food booths, each with an array of savory and sweet bites and boozy and non-boozy drinks. And while tasting around the world, you only have so much stomach space, right? You can't try everything, but luckily we do. So again, this is why you come here. Now for Festival of the Arts this past January to February, which of course we call farts, as you know, we were super disappointed in the Italian booth. It looked promising at first, that fried cheese dish with all the sauces, but it was ultimately a letdown. The mozzarella fritta was pretty pricey for a single puck of fried cheese, $8.25. And the ravioli a fungi was also too expensive for the portion size at $9.25. Meanwhile, during Flower and Garden, we just haven't been a huge fan of those specialty funnel cakes over at the funnel cake stand for the past couple of years now. For Flower and Garden 2022, it served a cherry blossom funnel cake that tasted like cherry cough syrup. Then in 2023, the offering was a banana split funnel cake that was fine, but there really wasn't anything to recommend it. And at $11.50, that's steep for a dessert we're not crazy for. Thankfully, these festivals still managed to impress us with several other offerings that we did think were worth our money. And now that Food and Wine Festival has literally just started up, we're making our way around to each of those food booths and tracking down its very best festival items too. Food & Wine is running from now up till November 18th, by the way. So how can you make sure you're ordering the food you're gonna love when you're at an Epcot festival? Well, don't forget to check out our festival videos here on the DFB channel. We go around and we eat every single thing at every single booth and highlight our absolute favorite eats and drinks of the fest, just to give you an idea of what to expect when you're there. The DFB website also has posts dedicated to the full menus across all the festival booths and full reviews of every single booth. That way you can study up on every offering and make a list of your own must eats before your next visit. Again, we do all the hard work so you don't have to and you can just eat the good stuff. Next up to avoid in Disney World when it comes to food are disappointing burgers. Okay, a burger should not make you sad. A Disney World burger should really not make you sad because you're probably paying too much for it, but alas, some still do. And I'm not just talking about the hockey puck like patties you might find at many of the quick services inside the parks. Even several of Disney's table service restaurants have burgers that simply don't live up to our expectations, especially for the price. With that being said, there are also some truly satisfying burger eats in Disney World, and let's talk about those instead. Over at Regal Eagle Smokehouse in Epcot, you can get the barbecue burger, which is made with a third pound Angus burger on garlic toast, topped with barbecue pork, garlic aioli, and a fried onion ring. It also comes with your choice of side, so hello, mac and cheese. A burger on garlic toast is already a dream come true, but that super juicy patty and tangy barbecue pulled pork and smoky crunch from the massive onion ring 
makes eating this one even more awesome. And the Steakhouse 71 Stack Burger at Disney's Contemporary Resort speaks to the heart of all cheese lovers out there. This one's made with a signature blend of beef, ooey gooey American cheese, lemon aioli, red onion, and house-made pickles, all served on a brioche bun. Not only is this a nice, thick, and juicy patty, but the ingredients on top are fresh and tasty too. And the cheese alone? Give my compliments to the chef, please, and thank you. And then there's Deluxe Burger over at Disney Springs, which just has a plethora of gourmet burgers for you to try, like the bacon and blue cheese burger and the barbecue burger. They even have seasonal options from time to time too, so keep your eyes peeled and your taste buds ready for that exclusive burger goodness. Next up on the list, snacks that aren't worth your Disney Dining Plan credit. All right, we haven't talked about this in a very long time, my friends, but with the Disney Dining Plan returning in 2024, it's almost time for you to become a pro on all things DDP and knowing how to get the most out of your snack credits. For those of you who are new to the Disney Dining Plan scene, here is a brief recap to help catch you up. With the DDP, you pay a set amount before your trip to get a certain number of credits that you'll use on meals and snacks throughout your stay. So essentially, you'll prepay for your Disney meals and make your vacation feel more all-inclusive. Once it's time to pay for your actual meal in Disney World, you'll simply use your credit to cover the cost of your food instead of paying out of pocket at that time, since you've already paid for the dining plan. And that's the short of it, but if you're looking for a more detailed breakdown of what you can expect from this returning plan, or if it's even going to be worth the investment or not for your specific trip, you can always check out our Disney Dining Plan Guide, now live on dfpstore.com. But right now, let's talk about DDP snack credits. Depending on what Disney Dining Plan you choose, you'll have an allotted amount of credits to spend on strictly snacks during your trip. While those snack credits can be used at a variety of spots throughout the parks and resorts, not all of these snacks are created equal. The sweet spot for Disney Dining Plan eligible snacks is $6. If the snack you want is under $6, it's probably better to pay out of pocket for it. If it's over $6, then that's a good use of your dining plan credit. And the sole reason for this is because you want to get as much out of your dining plan as you can. So if you spend your dining plan credits on a bunch of $4 snacks, then you're not getting the most out of your money. But of course, that's up to you. You can do that anyway totally your call. But we do have a few DDP eligible snacks that are going to be some of the best bang for your buck or credit. Let's look at a few. If you're in the mood for something cold and sweet, you can head over to the Plaza Ice Cream Parlor in Magic Kingdom for an ice cream sundae. These normally range in price from $7 to $9. Using snack credits is a great way to taste your way throughout the Epcot festivals too. Most items on the menus that don't include alcohol should be included in your snack credit options. All Disney Dining Plan eligible options will be labeled with a little square DDP icon next to the item's name on the menu. They're little purple squares. Okay, now here's a controversial one for you, but if you're a Star Wars fan, you might be interested to know that the blue and green milks over at the milk stand in Hollywood Studios are a single snack credit. If you're wanting to try these drinks out for the first time and you've heard that people are pretty indecisive on whether they love these or hate them, then using a snack credit instead of spending $8 to $9 on something you may not like could make this risk a little easier to take on. Over in Animal Kingdom, we recommend the baked mac and cheese dishes at Eight Spoon Cafe, specifically the one that's topped with pulled pork for around $7. Now, if you find you have a few snack credits left over at the end of your trip, don't let them go to waste. No snack credit left behind. Instead, Head to a location like the Main Street Confectionery and load up on a few take-home snacks. We're talking packaged goodies that you can take home with you and enjoy later or give out as gifts to your house sitter or your babysitter or your dog sitter or whatever, like bagged candies, Rice Krispie treats, popcorn, etc. Now, I wouldn't recommend getting these as a first choice, but it's better to grab them and spend your DDP credits on something instead of not using them at all, which, believe it or not, happens a lot. Now, how about restaurants that are too much of a gamble? This one's tricky, but I need to talk about it with you. There are some Disney World restaurants out there that have been major coin flips for us. At times, these restaurants have been good, and at other times, we've been less than impressed. This goes for restaurants like Tony's Town Square in Magic Kingdom, Coral Reef in Epcot, Mama Melrose's in Hollywood Studios, or Planet Hollywood in Disney Springs. When you're paying a good chunk of change to dine at Disney World, then eating somewhere with a 50-50 track record isn't comforting. Instead, you might want to prioritize reservations for Disney restaurants that have built themselves a positive reputation over the years, like Sanaa at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge, where you can dine with a view of the savannah, Ohana at Polynesian Village Resort, with its delicious all-you-care-to-eat Polynesian feasts or family style and chill island atmosphere, Morimoto Asia in Disney Springs this is a pan-Asian restaurant that focuses on signature Chinese, Japanese, and Korean cuisine, or Grand Floridian Cafe with moderately priced options and a classy atmosphere for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But here's my big disclaimer for ya. 
All of Disney's restaurants change their menus and staffing regularly, so a spot that used to be meh could now be helmed by the chef from your favorite restaurant. And the exact opposite could be said about those restaurants we always rate so highly too. I have definitely had dud meals at Ohana, my friends, and I used to love the food over at Territory Lounge in Disney's Wilderness Lodge, but then they took away a lot of the menu items I loved, like the fondue and the seasonal cobblers, and replaced them with new menu items that I'm not as thrilled about. Though I still love the vibes here, it's just not worth trekking all the way over to Wilderness Lodge to go to Territory Lounge when I could just go to Geyser Point instead. Then I can't tell you how many times I've changed my mind about San and Helen Restaurante in Epcot. But that's why we're always returning to these restaurants and updating our reviews of them, both on our YouTube channel and the DFB website and in our DFB guide. That way, we can take that gamble for you, and you don't have to miss out on a restaurant that could become an unexpected favorite. Now, where are my plant-based eaters? You do not want to waste your money on mid-tier plant-based food, right? Sticking to a plant-based diet in Disney World is easier to manage than it used to be, but that doesn't mean all those plant-based options out there are winners. For example, the jackfruit gyro from Sunshine Seasons has a bitter, weirdly sour flavor to it that was just kind of off-putting if you're not expecting it. The saving grace for this one was the veggies on top. The fresh cucumbers and pickled onions had some flavor, but not enough to make us want to go back and order it over and over again. The cheese, quote-unquote, pizza at Pinocchio Village House is yet another disappointing option we could tack onto our pizza category. But never fear, there are definitely several super satisfying plant-based offerings around the Disney scene, so you don't have to stress over your plant-based meals being never quite living up to your expectations. Over at the Friar's Nook in Magic Kingdom, there's a plant-based bratwurst and tots that's definitely worth checking out. You can also top off your brat with mustard and sauerkraut to give it a little more tang and a lot more texture. I will say that the plant-based bratwurst sausage over at BB Wolf's in Disney Springs is one that we prefer over the Friar's Nook version, but if you're in Magic Kingdom for the day and not planning on hitting up Springs, then Friar's Nook is still a solid choice. At Sunshine Seasons in Epcot, you can find the Mediterranean Vegetable Sandwich, which has roasted red peppers, red onions, tomatoes, arugula, hummus, and balsamic vinaigrette served on herbed focaccia bread. This is packed with flavor. The peppers, onion, and arugula provide a nice, refreshing crunch, and the hummus provides a smooth, creamy texture. Best of both worlds. Okay, how's about one more for the books? The toasted lobster roll at Rosie's All-American Cafe in Hollywood Studios isn't actually lobster at all. It's actually hearts of palm marinated for 48 hours and topped with celery, sweet apples, and a creamy dressing made with vegan mayo, dill, lemon juice, and nori seaweed. While the sandwich doesn't taste like imitation seafood whatsoever, it does taste like a fresh salad on a buttery roll, which is totally a-okay. Plant-based dining might be everywhere around the Disney parks and resorts, but you're still gonna need to study up on how to dine around these restaurants without major hiccups. When you're searching for plant-based items to order via the My Disney Experience app, tap on the little double leaf icon at the top of the mobile order screen. That way, the My Disney Experience app can immediately scroll you down to the specific plant-based options listed for that specific menu. For table service dining, plant-based options are also clearly labeled on the menus via the Disney World website. However, you'll still want to note on your advanced dining reservation if there are any plant-based guests in your group. That way, the restaurant can prepare for your group in advance and make sure everything goes smoothly during your meal. So dining in Disney World is a different experience for everyone, meaning there's no 100% right or 100% wrong way to do it. However, there are ways to make your dining experiences better and more worth your limited vacation time and hard-earned cash. And we promise to continue updating you on all the latest Disney World restaurant news and tips and recommendations so that you know what to expect before you go. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.